brand new show in 2022, The Music of Cream, featuring family members Kofi Baker and Will Johns hit the road, performing Disraeli Gears and Clapton Classics. Hello, I'm Kofi Baker. There's a lot of improvisation, which is really fun for me to play, and it was really fun for my dad to play. Opportunity for us to interpret this groundbreaking music and bring it into the now. And you'll listen to Play That Rock and Roll. The Music of Cream performed Israeli Gears and Clapton Classics live in concert. Tickets on sale now. And you can check out any time you want. Just call me Joe. And I can play that rock and roll for you. This is not a test. This is Play That Rock and Roll. I'm your host, Joseph K. And like the song at the start says, just call me Joe. Today we have another guest. And that is Kofi Baker, the son of the legendary drummer from Cream, Ginger Baker. Kofi came on the show to discuss his band, The Music of Cream, which is a celebration of that legendary band Cream with Ginger Baker, Eric Clapton, and Jack Bruce. Ginger Baker sadly passed away a few years ago, and around that time, Kofi partnered with Jack Bruce's son Malcolm and Eric Clapton's nephew, Will Johns, to form The Music of Cream, and they set out on a tour to celebrate the 50th anniversary of Cream's founding. Unfortunately, as we all know, the COVID-19 pandemic turned the music industry upside down and the music of Cream was one of many bands that was forced to go off the road. And since then, they have revamped the lineup. So now Kofi and Will Johns have a new tour that's built around Cream's iconic Disraeli Gears album, as well as Eric Clapton's early solo hits. I invited Kofi on the show because I'm a big fan of this project, and tours like these really need fan support. So in this conversation, we talk about some of the struggles that this tour has faced, how Kofi keeps himself healthy and fit while on the road, and why they chose this album and those Clapton songs to perform in the set. We also discuss the Beware of Mr. Baker documentary, Kofi's favorite songs from his father's career, and also the sad reality of Ginger's final years. Kofi was incredibly candid, and I really appreciate how frank and honest he was about some rather tricky subjects. So, go to musicofcream.com to check out tour dates and see if they're coming to a venue near you. They are playing the United States this summer, and then they're going over to Europe in early 2023. Also, Kofi and Will Johns are both on Facebook and Twitter. So without further ado, here's my conversation with Kofi Baker, the drummer for The Music of Cream. Yeah, well, there's the positive. The music's great. Yeah. I mean, the playing is 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 stellar, and the playing is is what we do it all for. I mean, yeah, the whole the whole touring thing. I mean, I've been broke as hell. That's the thing. I've been broke as hell for the last two years, and trying to get back on the road. And then, uh, well, you didn't record this stuff, but then like losing all the stuff, having our bike stolen, having my pedal stolen. Um, and then the second bike, which I have to replace all the wheels for because someone backed into the bike rack, breaking the bike rack. So like, I'm probably, like I said, I've lost money on this tour with the stuff I've lost. So, you know, that's why I'm scared about going back out on the road again because, you know, I can't afford to lose money. I'm, oh, I'm broke. <laughs> that's got to turn or start to turn around at some point, though. Well, um, I mean, I hate to say it can't get no worse, but I better not say that. Right? Yeah, don't say that. Don't say that. It can always, it can always get worse. But uh, at, at least you have uh, the the time on stage. So let let's start with this. So uh, I saw you guys back in uh, 2018, right, uh, on that first tour. I saw you at the Paps Theater in Milwaukee, and I know you guys were originally supposed to play Milwaukee like um, next week. And I, I hate to even ask, but did was was there some shows that had to get canceled? Yeah, unfortunately, um, the pandemic is still looming. Uh, yeah. People aren't coming out. And this, we, I, we were asking the clubs what's going on because we were selling out shows before the pandemic, and we were like 
half full this time round. And the club said, it's not you, everybody across the board. Yeah. It, it's just the turnout has been really bad. People are not coming out. And that's why I urge people, if you like live music, yeah. get out and see it. Because if you don't support it, it's going to go down. It's going to go under. Um, and we're going under as it is. So Music of Cream won't be touring anymore if, we don't get the turnout for the last three weeks of the tour. I, I mean, I can't afford to tour like this anymore. I, I'm, I'm probably going to have to get a teaching gig and just stay to local gigs, you know, to stay alive. Um, Cause it's, you know, like you said, touring is normally what supports musicians, but right now with people not going out, going out and supporting live music anymore and just staying home and the whole YouTube thing. I don't know. I think, I hope this isn't it for live music. I hope this isn't going to be the end of live music as we know it, but it could be. It could be the only bands that go out and tour are going to be like, you know, Britney Spears, you know, Eric Clapton can still sell out, you know. Yep. Um, it will be only the big, big acts that will be going on the road. All the medium or lower acts won't be able to afford to go out on the road anymore because the bus, you know, you have to, when you're touring like on, you know, on the road, you have to have a bus. And Unless, you know, if your routing's really good, if there's only two to three hours drive between every gig, you can do it in a van and use hotels, which is a lot cheaper. But if you've got like eight hour drives between gigs, there's no way you can do it without a sleeper bus, you know, because right. you've got to go to sleep while they're driving. So when you wake up, you get to the venue and you sound check and everything like that. And you've got your day to do it. Otherwise, there's no way you're going to get up at like, you know, eight o'clock in the morning and do an eight hour drive and get there at four in the afternoon and be prepared to play a show. Right. You know, sound checks at four. Anyway, you know, you normally get in at two o'clock and they load in sound check at four, sound check four to five, dinner at six, you know, doors at seven, show at eight. So there's really no time on the road to do anything. I, my job is playing drums. I have hobbies. My hobby is working out, which is health, mm -hmm. you know, um, but, you know, a car mechanic was my hobby when I was younger, but not anymore. But so for me, my job is drumming. So I will set my schedule. So when I'm on stage, I'm at my peak. I'm at my, you know, most awake. So yeah. um, that's how I always set my schedule. If I'm playing late shows when I'm home, if I'm playing club dates, you know, and I finish the date at 12 or one o'clock in the morning and I drive home, I'll go to bed at three or four in the morning and, and wake up at 12, one in the afternoon. You know, that's what I do. If I'm on the road, I, my schedule's a bit earlier. When we did the cruise ship gig, we went on at like two o'clock in the afternoon. So I made sure I was up by like nine mm. or 10, mm -hmm. you know, so make it, I go to bed earlier. So I don't understand musicians that um, have this weird thing that they have to get up early in the morning and, and, and and wake up and sit on the bus for four hours you know yeah <laughs> that seems you know, counterintuitive yeah but unfortunately uh you know there's will is one of those guys he likes to go fishing and stuff like that oh, and get okay. up and so uh, you know he you know and he got sick on the road i mean you can't keep that up Oof. morning and not sleeping i'm normally the one to get sick on the road because i'm so like healthy i get yeah. on the road and i get my juices and i don't get my stuff i normally get sick but this time i managed to instead of juicing my stuff i bought raw beets and i ate the raw beets you know cut them up ate raw beets and raw carrots and ate everything raw which kept me from getting sick and i yeah. and i cut on the road and i made sure i had a lot of garlic and ginger in my food i travel with a cooker i have an actual cooker in a case so i wheel oh. a case club and I pull out my, you know, double burner electric cooker with a pot and a pan and all my food. And I have a cooler. I travel on the road with a cooler. And so I wheel the cooler and the cooker into the, the venue and I cook all my meals and prep them all for two or three days and then put them in my cooler. Because, of course, you can't use the fridge on the bus because everybody else is using the fridge on the bus for yeah, their left. Wow. And, and the fridge on the bus ends up like so disgusting because everybody leaves their leftovers in there and watching <laughs> someone put coffee in the freezer. And oh. I'm like, freezer shipping for frozen food or frozen berries. Someone put coffee in there and exploded and the freezer was full of coffee granulates everywhere. And you open the freezer, coffee fell out. Eating healthy on the road must be a genuine challenge because like the old adage about touring musicians is that you guys live out at like diners and you know, these late night diners with crap food i mean like to counter that you're gonna to have to bring your own stuff with you right right well most musicians do that 
I'm yeah. like a rarest. I'm yeah. a very rarity, but I'm at off now. I work out and I eat really, really good. I don't use sugar. I don't have processed mm. food. All my food is, I cook it raw. I'm a vegetarian, so I don't okay. eat meat. So it's harder to find a protein in food. If you're not eating, if you're going out in a restaurant, they'll give you like a quinoa bowl or something, which is quinoa is good protein, but quinoa and that alone is not enough protein. You know, you need to put soy and all that right. kind of stuff. So I do a lot of, um, tofu and uh, uh, edamame beans and stuff like that which is really good protein so when i'm on the road you know i i buy i go to a supermarket i buy all my food um i cook it in, in the venue or the hotel room where again i prep it for like two or three days it lasts me two or three days so when everybody else is getting their buyouts you know 20 30 bucks to go out which is enough to get one meal i've mm. spent that i've got three meals ah you know? okay okay so not only am I saving money but I'm eating really healthy and I'm eating really good food cooked the way I cook it with, you know, no processed food, none of this stuff. So really, truly it's the way to go. I mean, everybody should, you know, have a cooker and a cooler if they want to be healthy on the road. It, you know, yes, you have to sit there and cook for an hour, but to go out and find food sometimes takes it along anyway. Yeah. Sometimes you know, I've, I've bought my food and I'm cooking it. By the time I've cooked all my meals, they're back from, you know, going to their food and I've got all my food in, in one, one day. So being on the road, yes, it's definitely a lot of musicians definitely do the, you know, crappy food, diners, eating out. Eating out's good once in a while, you know, but, um, you know, you can't really eat out all the time unless you're going to really nice restaurants and then you're spending a lot of money. Right. Well, what you're saying reminds me of something I heard Paul McCartney talk about in a, on a, on a podcast where he said that back in the 70s, you know, in the 80s when, you know, he was a, a vegan or vegetarian before that was sort of mainstream, he would go into some small towns where he genuinely could not find vegetarian options at all, you know, but now we're in a time where most major cities at least have, you know, if not all and out uh, vegetarian restaurants, but you can find, you know, your options in any major supermarket. So at least you have that, right? That's very true. I've noticed that all the diners and everything i went out when i do eat out there is a vegetarian option most yeah. of the time they're they're not the greatest but sometimes they are sometimes they're really good i've had some great vegetarian meals in some restaurants but sometimes if you go to a bar like if you if your only option is a bar food place they're right. not gonna they might have something like oh you can buy some fries or something you know and there you yeah. go this vegetarian meal you know uh, uh, so, uh, give me a burger without the burger you know so you get <laughs> A bun with some, and I don't eat bread either. You know, I'm oh. like, I eat, I eat, like if I eat bread, it's Ezekiel bread, you know, no flour. I don't eat flour. Okay. Um, you know, so when I make my, uh, my edibles, my, my um, edibles for my, you know, keep my mind sane because I'm a pothead. So I yes. have to eat my, when I make my edibles. Um, I make them with no sugar. I make them with almond flour and um, sweetened with honey. So honey, you know, my girlfriend always have to go at me for honey and eggs, you know, like chickens. What I say, what's the, you know, you take a chicken from an egg, you know, a, an egg from a chicken. What, what the hell? She goes, well, in the, in the wild, they would re-eat the egg. So if oh, they okay. had an unfertilized egg, they would eat it. So they get the nutrition back. So you're kind of, you know, and with bees with honey, you're taking away the honey and then you're feeding them sugar water. So you're basically taking away their really good food and giving them McDonald's, yeah. you know, so. <laughs> Well, what's more American than that? <laughs> exactly. You know, Donald Trump likes McDonald's, doesn't he? <laughs> we won't go into politics. Don't start me off on politics. No, no. Stay away from religion and politics. Stick to the music. Yeah. Don't worry. No Eric Clapton vaccine questions today, I promise. <laughs> I got vaccinated and everything, and I was like, you know, if everybody had just got vaccinated earlier on and, and quarantine, maybe the music business wouldn't have been so screwed. But, um, but like I said, you know, it's the touring is really hard now. And I wish people would just, you know, if you're not vaccinated, you know, just go out to a show anyway. I don't care yeah. anymore. We've got to keep live music going. Um, I know, you know, like on that note, I I, I want to jump in here because what you were saying was 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 interesting about um, how it really hasn't come back yet. I just went to see a concert. I went to see Kiss. 
at this big venue here in Milwaukee. It's their farewell tour. It's the last time they're ever going to be in Milwaukee. And there were big chunks of the back that were empty. It wasn't a full house, which is really interesting. Right. And I and I was hoping to see you guys next week. So I, I think what you were saying earlier is there's like it's really important right now for music fans to come on out and support their bands right. because the whole industry is trying to catch up after what happened with COVID, which was uh, yeah, I mean, disastrous. the bus, it's, it's all the way down the chain. The bus companies have gone out of business. Uh, all the way down the chain, clubs have, have, have closed. Clubs are not giving guarantees anymore. Then when, when you tour like we do in a bus, you know, $1,000 a day for a bus and stuff like that, you have to have guarantees. You can't like yeah. do it on door gigs because, you, you know, so it is really important. I mean, the great thing is, is we have the best band right now we've ever had. This is definitely the best band. It's, it's, it's insanely good. So we need to have people come out and see it again, because like I said, before the pandemic, we were selling out. So we know that there is the people out there. So I just think that either, you know, the, the pandemic has killed a lot of our demographic because our demographic is older. And a lot of oh, older people shit. have been affected yeah. by the pandemic, you know. So I wonder if a lot of our pandemic have, have died or really sick or just so sick now they can't go out. Or they're yeah. scared. They're scared to go out because, you know, their friends have died or people have died. So, um, I mean, I know four people that have died. Yeah, so I know people, it yeah. Was, it, was a, it wasn't a, a, you know, a, a fake pandemic. It wasn't. No. It no. was real. But what we should have done, like I said, is we should have all like really quarantined and vaccine and taken this thing seriously in the beginning. And yeah. then we would have, you know, it would have been gone a long time ago. But unfortunately, it's it's no one really took it that seriously and it spread so bad. And it's like, but now we need to get over it. OK, yeah. it's not that bad anymore. I know if you've got an immune system compromised and stuff like that, maybe you should either get vaccinated or stay home. But for everybody else, it's not that bad. It's like catching a flu. Well, especially especially if you're at an outdoor venue, there's almost no risk at all. You know, outdoor venues are so much safer in any way. So uh, how about this? Um, you know, so attendance has been shaky, but like of the people that are coming out to see you, how has the reception been to this new Disraeli Gears focused tour? I mean, great. Like people have been saying, this is the best band, the best band they've ever seen and everything. So, yeah. I mean, that's what I'm saying. It's such a shame because before the pandemic, we had a good band, but it was nowhere near as good as the band we have now. The band we have now is just way better. Um, so it's such a shame that we were selling out with that band. And now this band is twice as good and we have half the people. Oh, so okay. Like, yeah. You know, we need to, we need to get people to say, you know, to come out to the shows, like I said, People need to support live music. This is a very critical time yeah. to support live music because everybody's getting back out on the road and they're trying to get themselves back. And if, if people don't go out and see it, the clubs are just going to, are not going to take any risks anymore. And they're not going to, they're not going to take on the, the, the acts that are not selling out. So all the acts are going to go. So the only acts you're going to see are the big acts. Like the, right. like, you know, like I said, the kisses, the Britney Spears, the Clattons, you know, those are the only acts that are going to be left touring, which is okay, but there's a lot of other great music out there. And, you know. Most of my favorite concert memories are seeing, I guess, mid level or smaller acts than the stadium shows. Like, you guys were supposed to play, I know, I know you're playing like theater gigs. Those are really where you get the most intimate, engaging concerts where you can see the fans and they can see you. And you're not, you know, way in the nosebleeds, you know, feeling like you're 30 miles away. When I played with Steve Marriott, the Humble Pie guy, I don't know if you know Steve Marriott, Humble Pie. Yeah. Um, I was his drummer when I was like 18, 19. It was my first touring act I did. And he used to play smaller clubs two or three nights in a row rather than play one big gig. Because the one big gig, the sound's not as good. The sound yeah. for a drummer. Now, a drummer that's playing a huge venue, you have to simplify your drumming. You have to simplify everything because the... The sound can't, the, just everything, the movement of the sound, the air movement can't cope with fast, you know, chops or anything intricate. You have to really be simple and everything has to be, you know, really kind of blur, blur, blur. 
So the smaller gigs are much better. Like a jazz club, you can play jazz in a jazz club because you can be intricate. You can't play jazz on a, you know, at a 10,000-seater uh, venue. I mean, you probably right. can, but you have to simplify the hell out of it. Um, so, this is, you know, for me, it's these, these clubs, that like the 1,000-seater clubs is about as big as I like playing. You yeah. know, I like playing the two, three hundred seaters. You know, I'd prefer to play, you know, a two, three hundred seater three or four nights in the same place than, than to play a one thousand seater gig. I know it's all about money. You can make more money if you just hit the one gig. But, you know, when humans start realizing that money is not happiness, happiness is happiness. Money is their People like save their money and they make money and they save it so that they can have money and, and be happy, but they're, they're working their asses off and being unhappy to make the money. Just be happy, make less money and work less and be happy. I mean, money is not what's going to make you happy. I mean, my dad was a multimillionaire several times in his life and he was never happy. He was happiest yeah. when he had no money, when, he, when real people were around him, when he could actually, you know, when he was real. When you have like, when my dad made all his money, when he did that reunion in 2005, yep. it became like really like awkward because he didn't know who his friends were anymore. I mean, when they oh. got inducted, when they got inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, uh, Eric, Jack and my dad, right? I was yeah. in California when they got inducted and I was going to go um, to see, you know, see my dad get inducted. But my dad was going, you know, people are trying to come in and, they have only come in. They only want to be my friend because they only want to go to this, the, the, the induction. They only want to see me because I'm being inducted. So I said, you know, Dad, I'm not going. And the reason I'm not going is to prove that I'm not going just to, because I think you're famous. I'm your son, you know. Right. And my, my dad got pissed off at me because I didn't go. And my reason for not going was like, you know what, Dad? I'm proving to you that I'm not around you because you're famous. I'm around you because you're my dad. Yeah. But for some reason the fame and all the people around him and when he was famous or when he got any kind of thing, put him in that mindset that even he thought his family were only wanting to go to the gig because they wanted to be around, you know, and get the limelight. And they, you know, I'm Ginger Baker's son, so I can be, Oh, I'm at the real, Hey, I'm Ginger Baker's son. And yeah. it's like, that's not the reason I would go in. I'd, I'd go to support you, dad. And yeah. that, that's the problem. So, you know, it's actually better to, to have, you know, I think it's better to be, rewarded for having less and be more like you know environmentally better i mean nowadays you're rewarded for having more the rich you are the less money you have to spend for everything the you know if you're a rich famous musician you don't have to buy your gear it's given to you for free if yeah. you're a poor struggling musician you have to pay top dollar for your stuff you know so right. it's all backwards it's all backwards it really is i mean you know you should get rewarded for having less not not rewarded for having more well it's like that in in sports too you know all the most famous athletes will get you know sponsorships and free equipment sent to them anytime they want you know just because they'll pose for a photo with it where it's just like the you know the kids who are trying to learn you know it's all you're right it's totally warped, it's totally warped. Oh, so man. i mean you know when when you know when when we get people in the uh hopefully the younger generation will be better at you know making the, the environment and the the planet a better place i'm hoping because us old people are we're not doing a good job at it <laughs> no well you know what's interesting is that because you know covid made so many people work from home or lose their jobs there has been a, a real re-examination of you know especially there why that there's that worker shortage now nobody's you know taking the crappy fast food jobs right now because it's you know seven dollars an hour or whatever is not worth you know, the stress and misery you have to put up with to make that crap. So, all right, now we're getting too close to politics. <laughs> let's keep that music. Yeah, 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 back to music, back to music. Let, let's talk about the tour. Let's talk about how you designed the tour. So this time out, you're doing Disraeli Gears and early Clapton Classics. So Disraeli Gears, uh, that's such a great record. Let's talk about that first. We were doing the whole Disraeli Gears album, but what happened was... We were running out of time, so okay. we had to drop a few. So we dropped Mother's Lament at the end. We were doing Mother's oh, Lament. Okay. And we dropped, um, we dropped Blue Condition, which is the one I sing. And the reason okay. we did that was because uh, when I'm singing on a mic and I'm playing drums, uh, the drums bleed into the mic. So mm, when I'm singing, everybody else is 
to get to my tune singing and the sound man has a hard time making the sound sound as good because there's all this bleed coming in the microphone. So yeah. we're like, okay, well, let's drop that one. And then we ended up dropping Take It Back because we thought, well, we've got other better songs. Take It Back's a, a good song, but it was kind of a filler. It's kind of a blues, you know, take it back. You know, it's kind of just a shuffle. Yeah. So actually not really playing the entire Disraeli Gears album now. We're taking Take It Back and Blue Condition out. So, and we're, we're putting more of the Blind Faith in because there's like so many great Blind Faith songs. Like, you know, um, like, you know um, Presence of the Lord, uh, Can't Find My Way Home. Look, this band plays so well that we were thinking these songs are so good. You know, we've got to play them. And those bands are so closely connected too, right? I mean, a lot of people would say Blind Faith is like a sister group or a daughter group or something to, to Cream because it's two of the three members. Right. I mean, it, but it's, it's the same style of music. Yeah. I mean, in a way, except for Cream was more jam. You know, yeah. Blind Faith was, oh, Blind Faith still jam though. I'll do what you like is all jam. Cream, Cream was more of a three piece kind of power trio. Uh, yeah. Blind Faith was more, a little bit more sophisticated because it had the keyboards and stuff. Yep. Um, so we do it as a four piece because we have to cover Layla and the Clats and stuff, you know. So we have to do the four piece. We have to have the keyboard singer, um, you know, stuff in there. And, you know, so we're playing Clats and songs. So we were running out of time um, to, so we've had to drop a few. We're, we're just dropping a few of the weaker tracks out of the Disraeli Gears yeah. album. Hey, yeah, and that's okay. I mean, it's still a strong set. How did you guys decide to um, make a whole second set that's mostly that early classic Clapton? What, what made you want to bring that discography into the show? Well, that's, that's Will's deal, because Will's, okay. you know, Eric Clapton. I mean, right. I don't really feel um, comfortable playing Clapton's music. After playing with him, you know, I mean, and Clapton's alive and he's playing his music. So I'm like, yeah. why am I doing it? My dad's music, I understand, because one they weren't playing cream you know when i started doing it they, they were stopped yeah. um and two, now my dad's dead it's even more important i keep it going but yeah but playing someone's playing someone's music that they're out there do, touring as as the band seems like why would you do that i understand doing a tribute to a band that's not playing anymore yeah or, or covering their songs that are not playing anymore but i was i was a little bit hesitant of that so that was really all will's will's deal um is that an opportunity for him to sing? Is that what he's looking for, so he can sing? Well, I don't really know. I mean, a lot of it also is Clapton's name is more famous than, obviously, oh, Cream. yeah, of course. If you say, hey, do you know Cream? They go, no. Do you know Eric Clapton? Oh, yeah. So, you know, Clapton's name sells a bit more, so it brings in ticket sales. Oh, sure, so yeah. that's another reason why we're doing the Clapton stuff. I mean, it's not that I don't like the Clapton stuff. It's just not my bag. I mean, I would, yeah. play, I would play Clapton stuff with Clapton because he'd be paying me a lot of money and I'd be like, yeah. fuck. But, you know, as we're making no money on the road, I want to play music that I, I really get to be myself. Yeah. With Clapton stuff, the drumming is a lot simpler. You know, and it's very, uh, it's all about the guitar. Clapton's music, you know, the drummers, there's no drum solo in Clapton sets, you know. Um, and he's got Gad playing with him. He's one of the best drummers in the world, you know. Um, but Gad is playing, you know, for the music and Clapton's music is written as, you know, guitar orientated. It's very, mm -hmm. it's about Clapton. So for me to play Clapton stuff was like a little bit like why, when there's so much great cream and blind face stuff to play. Yeah. Uh, it was more, I think, ticket sales and, yeah. you know, Will, Will wanted to do it because, oh, you know, I've got some stories about the Clapton songs. Oh, okay. And, okay. You know, uh, you know, and, well, you know, so it's, it's been good. Right? So, yeah, I mean, compromise exactly. I mean, I, yeah. I get into playing the clouds and stuff, and I do like playing it. It's fun to play. But like I said, I would rather be playing all cream and blind faith. So, um, is there other stuff? Is there other stuff that your dad did outside of blind faith, like Ram Bond or Air Force or what, what was that, that uh, Masters of Reality? Are there other Ginger Baker tracks that you would like to bring into the set list if you were designing the show? Right. Well, if I was designing the show, I would have a lot of uh, Air Force in there because I think that's the great stuff. My dad was at his peak in Air Force. I mean, I thought Air Force was just like, it was well above, before its time. It was world music. It was world music before world music came into to stuff. Yeah, you know, uh, yeah. so I really want to, that's something I want to do, you know.
uh, other than this music, the cream stuff, um, I want to put a band together that plays purely my dad's legacy because I want to yeah. keep my dad's legacy alive. So it would be cream, blind faith, air force and some grain bond. I probably would do master reality. I might right. do one track, but, but yeah. you know, they were more of a, you know, a, a songwriting, you know, I don't think my dad was really on fire in rea in master's reality. I mean, yeah. they're great songs, but I'd like to, I'd like to keep my dad's legacy alive when my dad was at his peak. And I right. think his peak was Green, Blind Faith, and Air Force. You yeah. know, Graham Bond, obviously, as well, he was really doing well. But I think Air Force is the shit. I mean, yeah. And they only did like a couple of albums or something. I mean, um, it didn't do much stuff, but I want to keep that stuff going. And it's great jam music, too. And that's what I tell the kids of the day. I say, look, you guys, all you, you, you know, Grateful Dead kids and you, you jam kids and all you kids that like this jam music you've got to come to our show because we jam like no one else. Yeah. We jam high end jamming. You know, um, I've been playing drums for, you know, what, 50 years. I started when I was three and I've been practicing eight hours a day for the past 40 years. So I know my shit, you know? Yeah. Um, so there's not many drummers out there that can play like I play and do what I do with the jam. A lot of drummers, you know, just stay simple, you know, but I'm like, I'm in with the jamming. I'm following the, I'm changing time. I'm following the riffs. You know, I'm like, I'm like a jazz guy, like my dad, you know, jazz guy following the, the music. But in Queen, my dad did simplify. He did yeah. simplify. The whole thing was to, was to be a bit more commercial. So he did simplify a little bit for Queen. And that's why I love Air Force because Air Force, he came out of the, like, out the gate going for it. He didn't simplify at all. He just went for it. And it was great. I mean, and it's such a great name for a band too, right? Air Force, that's a, a beautiful name. But I gotta, I gotta tell you, I, I, you know, I've seen a lot of concerts in my life and I've seen a lot of like, you know, hard rock, heavy metal shows. And a lot of times shows like those will have drum solos. And in shows like those, it, it becomes a little dime a dozen. But when I saw you guys play at uh, uh, Paps Theater in 2018, uh, when you were doing your solos, like I was sitting uh, second row center and I'm not e even the biggest jam band type of guy, but like I really loved what you were doing. That was really melodic and like psychedelic. And I was totally into that that show. And, you know, just as as uh, a 60s rock fan, man, I, I just want to tell you, I love what you're doing. And I'm glad you're still doing it, despite all the disasters on the road this year. <laughs> Well, the band is definitely, um, it's a little bit different than when we did it with Malcolm because we, yeah. we were doing, we were really covering just cream yeah. um, because we were doing me and Malcolm at the sun. So we were just doing the cream. Right. Um, now as a four piece, we're, we're covering a, a little bit more and it's a little bit more like the blind faith kind of thing. Cause you've got the, the keyboards and the second guitar covering stuff, which is kind of, kind of cool. So it's a little bit, a little bit different, but it's still, we still jam our asses off. Um, but it's a little bit less. There's a little, because with, with the back then, we were going off. We were going out. We went, we, you know, we'd do spoonful for like 15 minutes and go. Oh, like, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Will can like take charge a little bit more and be, you know, like front man and not have to worry about wondering what the hell, where we're going. So yeah, yeah. It's, it's better in that sense in terms of, you know, Will can be the front man. I'm a drummer, so, you know, I'm used to backing, being a backing guy. I've done so many backing gigs, so I don't mind sitting in the back and playing the beat sometimes, you know, just keeping it simple. Um, you know, I prefer to be out front and going for it, but, you know, but we get half the set. The first set is pretty much me having fun. The yeah. second set is pretty much me. You know, I get my drum solo in the second set, so I still have fun, but the second oh, set okay. is me okay. more laying back, you know, playing for the music rather than, you know, going nuts, so... It's a little bit, you know, it's kind of cool because you've got the first set, which is really a little bit more out. And then the second set, which is a little bit more, you know, in the box. Okay, well, but before you get out of here, I wanted the one topic I wanted to bring up with you was, um, you know, the, the documentary uh, Beware of Mr. Baker is really what introduced me to your dad's music and not just the music, but like, you know, the person behind all that and who he was and like how important he was as far as rock and roll goes. And I wonder, you know, now that it's been 10 years since that's been out, when you think of that documentary and the guy who directed it, Jay Bulger, do you think he did your dad justice? Did he tell that story as it should have been told? Are you happy with it? Yeah, I think he did. Unfortunately, the, the documentary is very accurate. 
my dad is a genius it's, and when it comes to music you know i yeah. mean he bought drumming he, he did things to, to drums that no one ever done before and he bought drumming double bass drums into rock music and he was just a genius when it came to drumming but as a person i'm sorry he was an asshole. um yeah. he was really shitty to me uh, he was shitty to my whole family um i mean even when he died he, he left us nothing we've not yeah. seen a penny and I haven't even seen the snare drum that my dad gave me when I was a kid and took back and said I'd get it back when he died and never even got that back. No. So unfortunately, um, his wife took everything, absolutely everything, the drums, everything. And, and none of the family even went to his funeral because she blew us all out of that. No. So unfortunately, you know, um, my dad was an asshole and he somehow in his life, he managed to shun his entire real family yeah. And give everything to uh, someone who was only with him for money. And right. she got what she wanted. She got all the money. She got everything. But it's just such a shame that these famous people do that. They get to the end of the day, they meet some young woman and they go, you know what? I'll do everything if you just stay with me for the last 10 years of my life, you know, and, and you know, just you know, do it for me. And obviously the woman's like, yeah, I can do this, uh, everything for 10 years. Yeah, sure. Yeah. And then the families get screwed you know the real family gets completely screwed out of it i mean but there you go that's life i'm not you know i'm not bitter you know my dad did what he did you know i would you know my mom actually when my mom died she left me some money and i bought a house, so, <laughs> a house. yeah so you know is is um, yeah. is your is your dad's wife still in the united states or she was originally from africa right is she back in africa or is she she's still in the u.s in oh she's in england oh okay all right she moved to england because you know like uh when my dad was in America, obviously, um, when he was getting older and sick, you know, America's not really a great place to be when you're sick. Yeah. You know, England has that socialized medicine system. Yeah. So, you know, he went to England and got all his, everything taken care of. He even got on a pension and, and uh, got on, you know, social security and all that stuff, you yeah. know, because he was making much money in the last few years of his life. Um, and his wife was spending it all, everything, and sending it back to Africa and just, Spending all his money to take his credit cards. And my dad would be like, oh, no, i got to try and make money and get money because my wife's spending all the money. Because um, he was there just for the money, obviously. Is that why he went back on tour after the documentary? Right. That's, that, was, that was the problem with my sister, Nettie, who was telling my dad, don't do it. Don't go. Because that, there's a whole Facebook page with my dad being pissed off at Nettie because... Nettie was like, look, because the agent was saying, the manager, the agent was saying, you've got to go back and you've got to play these gigs and these gigs. And my dad was like, I need money. And she's like, okay, we do it for you this gig. And he, he was putting my dad on these low end gigs and working him so hard. And he was really sick and he was yeah. killing it. And my sister was like, no, don't listen to the agent. Um, I'll put you on just, you know, just work once or twice a month or once or twice a year. And let's just put you on some gigs, which you can make good money. And, Obviously, you know, the agent was, was saying, no, don't listen to the Netty. And, and, and so it got to a big thing where Netty was running the Facebook page. She put all her energy in and doing everything. And then the agent was saying, no, we need to run it. So she ended up blocking my dad from his own Facebook page. Oh, my God. <laughs> it was the agent. A Facebook page is running in my name that I have nothing to do with. It's being run by my daughter, who is pretending to be me. Look, yeah. and, and my dad got pissed and, and uh, put a thing on. So there is a Facebook page out there that's, that's yeah. got my dad saying, Nettie blocked me. And, and blah, blah, blah. But it was really Nettie doing the right thing for my dad. And my dad right. realized it in the end. But the agent has put this page, Facebook page up there. And it's obvious that my dad, it was, you know, my, she, they were telling my dad what to say as well. You know, because mm. my dad, is that what you want me to say? What is what you say? She, what she's doing is really dreadful. She's trying to destroy my career because I gave her the sack. Okay? So, you know, it was, it was the agent trying to force him to play all these gigs, which was totally wrong. That's why there was so much, you know, arguments between my my the agent and my sister because my sister was trying to do the right thing by my dad but right there you and go the agent's and just trying to get his cut right he's just trying to get the money because that's yeah. what happened with my dad died 
um, I said to Kutsi, his wife, I said, look, you better give me my dad's book. I better look after that book with all Eric's numbers, Stevie Wood, everybody's numbers in that book. That book should not get out into the agencies or any of those people. That My dad would never have given the agent Eric Clatton's number. Never. In a million right. years. The Kutsi, I said, look, give me that book. I'll burn it or I'll keep it safe. But there's no way... You know, that book, she goes, I will not give you the book. You will not get, you will not get nothing. You will get nothing. And she Jesus. gave the book and gave the book to the agent. Oh. So, <laughs> so I, I'm talking to Eric about doing something for my dad's funeral. Right. He gets hold of Eric and Eric's like, who are these people calling me? And I, I'm sorry, I'm out. I'm not going to, I'm not going to turn up to the funeral. I'm not going to think because these people are calling me and they're suspect. So it backfired on them. Yeah. You know, so they, none of the family were at the funeral. Eric wasn't, nobody, nobody was at the funeral that had really knew my dad really well. Yeah. The only people at the funeral were Kutsi's, you know, African people. Yeah. Um, and I'm in no way racist against it. No, no, uh, of I, course, no. no I've yeah. got an African name. My best friend was African. Um, yeah. I, you know, uh, but, but these are bad people. Yeah. These are what, when you get those telemarketers and it's from someone from you know like you know obviously a, oh the, the the scams the nigerian yeah. uh yeah i know what you're talking about yeah it's those kind of people that that got in with my dad because yeah i don't know if anybody knows this but kutsi was an ex-prostitute she mm. was a prostitute and she is i don't know if i'm allowed to say this but she's still doing it in london and she was still doing it when she was with my dad <laughs> So it was obvious that she was with my dad for the money. She wasn't yeah. with my dad for love. Um, so, you know, she'll probably try and sue me now for this, but whatever. She, I don't have any money she can try. <laughs> you might to be sued right. for. She's but, not going to uh, see this. <laughs> okay. Well, oh, man, we got to find a better note to close out on here because uh, that's, that's tough. <laughs> Music is really good on this band. Please come out and see it. This is the best band we've had. Uh, playing this stuff it's really good we're having a great time on stage um and it's we got we've still got the psychedelic thing going behind us on the, the bigger yeah. gigs so let's leave it on that note that this music is really good and i'm having a great time playing it oh that's awesome before you go and and, I, and what i'll do is say it as an addendum to that you know i i unfortunately i can't see you this on this tour because the, sh the show got canceled but when i did see you guys in 2018 uh, I thought that was an absolutely stellar show. It's one of my favorite memories uh, of seeing concerts. And, uh, you know, if you guys are going to, you know, get a chance to tour again in the future, I know this round sucked with Milwaukee, but don't give up on us. You know, there are Cream fans here. And well, uh, I think scheduled. I think those gigs have been rescheduled. Not oh, okay, okay. I think the clubs just wanted more time to let people get back. So okay. I think that the real reason they got cancelled, clubs were saying it's, it's across the board, everybody's doing bad. So they're postponing gigs um, because the attendance, people aren't you know, attending gigs anymore. So that's oh. why we really need to get this out there for fans of any type of music. Please oh, support yeah. your favorite band because this is the critical time to support your band. If, if, we, if we still don't support our bands now, it's all going to go under. Absolutely. Well said. Okay, well, as we leave, I want to I wanna tell you one quick story uh, about the time I saw your dad in concert. I did see him on that uh, tour in 2014. I saw him play in Milwaukee at, the, at Turner Hall, and he, it was a really cool show. And I know he was having a tough time, but it was a very cool show. And he at one point... Was that? Great. Yeah, great. Yeah, yeah, that's great. what I'm saying. Like, I was totally into it. And there was one point in the show where he was uh, explaining the meaning behind one of the songs he was going to play. And, you know, some moron in the audience shouted out for Toad. And then your dad paused and called him a fucking idiot and threatened to kill him. <laughs> it was the most that. rock and roll moment I've ever seen. And it was, it was awesome. So, so funny. Like, his, his thing he was explaining was why. He has a song yes, called Why. Yes. And he was like, why has this happened to me? Why does this happen to me? And I'm like, Dad, because you're an idiot. Yeah. That's fine. There's your answer. <laughs> anybody, anybody that can make the money he's made and blow it twice the same yeah. way is an idiot. Sorry. Oh. Idiot. <laughs> that's good shit. Kofi, you're a hell of a good interview. Thank you so much for coming on, man. This was a real joy talking with you.
Yeah, we'll do it again sometime. Let's do it as much as possible. Let's get these people out to the shows, you know? Absolutely. And that was Kofi Baker, the drummer for The Music of Cream. I need to thank Kofi for being such a fantastic guest and for all the work he's doing to keep his father's music and legacy alive. If you can, please go see this tour. I can tell you from personal experience, this is an excellent show, and these guys need your support more now than ever before. If you want to learn more, Music of Cream, Kofi Baker, and Will Johns are all on Facebook and Twitter. And to see tour dates, you could go to musicofcream.com. Again, they're touring the United States this summer, and they'll be going to Europe in early 2023. Otherwise, that's it for me. Thanks for tuning in, and keep rocking. Hey, thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, please remember the big four things you can do to support this show that don't cost a dime. Number one, listen to the show. If you're hearing this now, that means you did this part already. Thank you. There is an infinite amount of content out there, so you choosing to spend some time listening to this show means a great deal to me. Number two, if you like what we did here, please recommend this show to family, friends, or anyone you know who's looking for a podcast, particularly about music. Share our links in Facebook groups, subreddits, and recommendation threads. Whatever you can do is highly appreciated on my end. Number three, find us on social media. Follow us on Twitter, at PlayThatPodcast. Like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash play that podcast. And subscribe to our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash C slash play that rock and roll. Lots of great material like photos and vlogs on all three platforms. As play that rock and roll is very much meant to be a content hub as well as a podcast. And finally, the big ask. Number four. Please give us a five-star rating and a positive review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. I know this part is a hassle, but it really does help the show a great deal. Not just because it affects the algorithm, but also because it gives me something I can point to when pitching this show to potential guests. The more social media followers and positive ratings the show has, the better chance I have for booking high-profile guests for interviews. So if you take a moment to give us even just a five-star rating, you are actively giving us a tool to do bigger and better things here. But whatever the case, I appreciate any and all efforts you take to support us here at Play That Rock and Roll. Be sure to join us next time for more great stories and music from the world of classic rock. Ginger Baker, Jack Bruce, and Eric Clapton were the cream, and Israeli Gears, their groundbreaking multi platinum selling album. You can't escape from the fact that you're having fun playing with the guys. There was this whole new beginning for the band, a whole new vibe, and I loved that time very much. I think we were really kind of like a pivotal point in the history of popular music. And following sold out concerts across the UK and USA, family members Kofi Baker and Will Johns take to the road again, playing the whole album in the first set and all the Clapton classics in the second. There's a lot of improvisation, which is really fun for me to play and it was really fun for my dad to play. Opportunity for us to interpret this ground breaking music and bring it into the now. It's just a blast for us to be able to play it. And after performing with Eric Clapton in London, the band now celebrate his amazing body of work too. So you get the best of both Cream and Clapton in one concert. The music of Cream performs Disraeli Gears and Clapton Classics live in concert. Tickets on sale now.